And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the Abductables, currently crowdfunding its second issue, the Abductables 2, Reticulous. I'm hoping I get hoping I got the t subtitle proper. The one and yes. only the the one and only Michael. Don't call him Jordan. Derek, how are you doing tonight, man? Hey, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on your show. Yeah, I know uh, you, you you pronounced everything fine. I know I'm making up some new words with this uh, project, but uh, you did great. So, <laughs> um, I at the give it I. I'm a survi I'm a survivor of I'm a survivor of '90s image comics, so I'm used to ridiculous <laughs> words. Yeah, it's a uh, it's kind of a trend with uh, my projects because my previous one was actually a superhero book called Grayscale, and uh, I spelled that with a K, which is a uh, very image comics of me. So uh, <laughs> I think we're in the same boat as far as uh, understanding comic book uh, lingo. <laughs> But you're you're kind of disqual you're kind of disqualified from 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 from, from image com from the image comics comparison because um you actually have proper anatomy. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> also, zero out of ten, not enough pouches. You can never have enough pouches. That's what I always say. Which I I would I would keep making that joke when it, when it comes to Liefeld, but um. He made a character called called the pouch that is made of nothing but pouches with a gun that's that's made of nothing but pouches so yeah like, he kind of put put that to rest with that character <laughs> like well well meme over I'm not topping that yeah but, which is funny cuz Rob Liefeld's kind of I don't know he he's kind of sensitive when it comes to stuff like that so it was, it's nice when he's able to kind of uh roll with the punches and kind of uh, get in on the joke because, you know, obviously he gets a lot of criticism, but, uh, you know, I, I'm a fan. Um, I, I've, he used to be in my punching bag, but I've mellowed on him over, over the years. Plus, the comments that he's been making over the last few years when it comes to the state of comics have have put it where I'm, a, I'm in a um, special place in hell. Because because I find myself agreeing with the guy who was my whipping boy for a decade. <laughs> well, that uh, seems to be kind of a, a common uh, thing. Uh, I know it was definitely very popular to, to crap on Liefeld for many years, but uh, he's, he's kind of had a renaissance in the last few years. Uh, people have kind of uh, softened on him, like you said, and uh, they're kind of reevaluating, if not his work, then at least like him as a creator because uh, – you know, love or hate his art, he, he was very influential. And I agree, I, I really do kind of like his uh, his take on the industry. He, he's a guy who's not afraid to uh, state his opinion and uh, kind of go against the uh, the usual corporate talking points you hear from most yeah. creators. Um, some I know some people made fun of him when he when he um, got, when he got mad about Shatterstar being revealed to be gay, but I looked mm. into what he actually said on that, and he had a point. The thing that he the thing that he was fixated on was the fact that um, Shatterstars is his character, and that and he didn't let he and a lot of the other image guys are were are were and still are very big sticklers on creators owning their work, and mm -hmm. the idea the idea that one of his characters was what had this put had this put on them without con, without consulting him about it was the uh, burr up his ass. Yeah, that that definitely uh, that definitely makes sense to me. I mean, obviously, it's you know they're not going to be owning any of the characters they created for Marvel, um, but at the same time, I can understand because these uh you know the thing about Liefeld is he like outside of like Stan and Jack, like he probably created more iconic character or as many well not as many as Stan and Jack obviously, but you know any. Compared to any other creator besides those two, like uh, Rob Liefeld created a ton of like iconic characters uh, for Marvel, so I understand why he's uh, kind of protective of them. Yeah, 
and I can't pass judgment on that because I'd pro I'd probably be just as just as pro I'd, I'd probably just as pro be protective if I was in his shoes for that. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, that 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 makes sense. Uh, yeah, somehow throughout like all the uh, you know, the changes that have gone on through for for all these characters, like you know, turn it, you know, changing their race or sexuality and stuff. I missed the I missed the uh, memo that Shatterstar is gay now, but I guess I shouldn't be surprised. Apparent, apparently, it was apparently it was a it was for me for me personally. It's it's a, whenever I see those kind of things, I'm like, okay, you did it. Now what? And yeah. <laughs> I, and I hear deafen and I hear deafening silence because, um, I'd see that I'd having having survived the Russo years with with professional wrestling, I'd see this kind of thing of <laughs> of do the surprise of do the surprise swerve, but have no idea what to do after the fact. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of yeah cheap pop. <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah, you're gonna get the cheap pop, but then you, but then um then you don't but you don't think about what's happening afterwards. Um, exactly. Yeah, and it's uh, you know, Shatterstar is not exactly like a mainstream character either. Um, you know, they did that with they did that with Iceman. They made Iceman. Gay. Um, I think Iceman's a bit more of a iconic mainstream character. That, but well, I mean, he, well, it's, not, one of the first it's not like Shatterstar is a public, yeah, uh, like a household name or anything. I didn't care for how they did. Um, I I don't care for how they did that with Iceman either because. Um, one, he was basically gaslighted into thinking it, and two, um, it makes absolutely no sense regarding it regarding his character. No, not at all. Yeah, I mean, I remember in the '90s, like he was specifically like a horn dog for Rogue. So I mean, it's a uh, it, it was very uh, a very odd choice on their part. Well, let's be honest. Back back then, he was a horn dog for for pretty much everybody. That was part of his character was that he was a massive player. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he was kind of the uh, the playboy kind of uh, kind of airhead of the group. Like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which was which when you consider how serious everybody else was, you know, that's that kind of thing is needed. Um, mm -hmm. But more more on point, what what was the now we um. Since we kind of tackled the, we kind of tackled a little bit of a little bit of the um, former House of Ideas. But would yes. you say, would you say that you leaned more as leaned more towards being a Mar being a Marvel and an Image guy growing up? Uh yeah, I mean uh, yeah, in the uh, in terms of the comics, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously. Uh, DC always had a stronger presence in animation with the uh, with the um, with the you know Batman the animated series and mm -hmm. all the uh, spinoffs from Bruce Timm and stuff. But uh, as far as the comics goes, yeah, definitely Marvel and specifically Image because I was a big Spawn fan in particular. So oh, Man of Culture um, as well. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, Todd McFarlane is uh, one of my heroes as far as comics is concerned. So, uh, yeah, always a big Spawn fan. And, uh, yeah, it, in the 90s, it uh, seemed like Marvel was a lot cooler than DC. The they had the uh, edgier, edgier art, edgier stories. I remember, some, I remember someone making the remark that Marvel creates characters, DC creates icons, which is true to, which mm -hmm. is true to an extent. And that's not me saying one is better than the other in that sense. It's more of a it's more of a general attitude when it comes to the writing styles of both. Mm hmm. Yeah. That. Yeah. That's. Uh. I mean. I don't. I don't know if that even holds up now compared. Like you know, because no one. It seems nobody at either company really respects the characters. But yeah, for the longest time, it was. Uh. You know, DC had the kind of iconic. Uh, larger than life characters, and then Marvel had the um, down to earth kind of everyman characters, where they they had a, a more sense of realism uh, as far as like their interpersonal conflicts and mm -hmm. the stuff they had to deal with. Oh yeah. Now that now um when I looked into the abdu when I looked into the abductables, which you're which you're describing as a um, SF action comedy. Um. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, one of the things that went, and maybe this is just me, but one of the big things that I ended up thinking of 
was uh, was a lot of those first generation FPSs in the in the late nineties, especially mm -hmm. um, especially especially stuff like um, especially stuff like um, Doom, Duke Nukem, and actually not, while I'm at it, I may as well bring in the Holy Trinity when it comes to the build engine games. Um, that being um, Duke Nukem 3D, Shadow Warrior, and Blood, um, as well as some of their some of their successors, was would you say that that would you say that that was was, was that that was an influence or is that just coincidence on my part? Um, it wasn't a conscious uh, conscious influence, but I mean, it's definitely uh, you know you know I wasn't like a. Um, a hardcore gamer in the nineties or anything like that. But you know, that, that kind of imagery and uh, that kind of stuff, it, it, it just, you kind of absorb it. And uh, I could definitely see the uh, Duke Nukem comparisons with the uh, main character. But I think that's more a case of, um, you know, that, that kind of mid eighties, uh, early nineties kind of heroic archetype that you would see in pop culture that you really don't see anymore. That kind of, um, you know, almost like a pro wrestler physique. You know, the the guy, the big muscly dude with it was almost on steroids. That was that was kind of just like the prototypical action hero at the time. Um, and uh, but um, and as far as Doom goes, that that's a great comparison because you know I am a big fan of Doom the the uh, the game series. But I mean, one way I like to describe um, Abductables is basically just Doom but with aliens instead of demons. So. Uh, yeah, th th that's definitely a good comparison to make. Which is f which is funny because I'm not sure if you I'm not sure if you um, know about this. Um, originally, originally Dune was going to be much more inspired by um, aliens, but Fox wanted absolutely nothing to do with them, <laughs> so <laughs> so they went so they went with demons instead. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's one, that's one of the that's one of the many stories when it comes to how when it comes to how things worked out. Um, it all, yeah, it's funny how those uh, how those decisions can affect things in a, in a in a positive way. At least it worked out for Doom for sure. Yeah, and you you look at a you look at a lot of the a lot of the those um shooters that I mentioned, and it's a lot of them are very are very clear setups to to cheesy films that they that they had seen. Whether it be cheesy martial arts movies in the case of Shadow Warrior, or cheesy horror movies in the case of um, Blood. Or um, cheesy mm. action movies in the case of Duke Nukem. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, man, that that's that's such a lost art form that that uh, early '90s video game aesthetic, the PC game aesthetic. I'd, um, I'd say it. I'd say it's starting to come back, especially with the especially now that the phrase "boomer shooter" has entered um, lexicon, and with <laughs> stuff with stuff like um, I with stuff like Iron Fury, with stuff like Dusk and. Well, basically everything that New Blood has been putting out for the last few years, um, mm. <laughs> it you're, we're starting to see a comeback of that. Um, but the other the other um, thing that I see out of this is you've got a mix of that '90s aesthetic with also a little bit of the um, the the um, really the spa the really pulpy space opera that you would that you might see in that you might see out of say. Um, Flash, Go Flash Gordon, or Buck, or Buck Rogers, just yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I would. Another way I would describe Abductables would be like a degenerate Buck Rogers. <laughs> you know, it's got that. Uh, particular, particularly in Abductables Two, uh, which is where we kind of take things into space and visit all these different alien worlds and uh, alien races and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not as classy as some of those space operas, um, but uh, which is why I call it degenerate in a joking way. Um, but uh, you know, we, we there is uh, definitely a lot of influence. Uh, the thing about the um, the abductables is like you know we're primarily dealing with the uh, classic gray aliens, um, mm -hmm. but you know, as, other than the the design of the gray aliens, which everyone is familiar with, as far as their society and technology and stuff goes, you know. We kind of were we we had the option to take it in a bunch of different directions, but me and my artist Dubai Canales decided to give uh, their technology the kind of uh, 1950s retro fut futuristic look that, uh, like you said, is very evocative of the uh, 
space uh, opera pulp style of mm-hmm. Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon and stuff like that. So, uh, which which makes sense because you know you know going with the flying saucers and the ray guns and stuff, it just it, it kind of makes sense to uh, go in that direction. Yeah, and when it co- when when it's the the uh, panels that I that you showed in the uh, Indiegogo for the project. A major vibe that I kept that I kept getting is kind of a kind of a reversal of the of the of the way it typically works with somebody be, with somebody either working or abducted by aliens, where you've got you've <laughs> you've got you've got your you've got our hero um in a in very much the odd, very much the odd man out, but it's a it's a case where they're they're happy to you it seems that they're happy to use them, but just don't get don't um don't do anything that might set him off otherwise you might lose pieces <laughs> yeah yeah exactly uh yeah that's the thing is uh going from uh book 1 to book 2 we completely flipped the dynamic um because you know the the premise of the original abductables for people who don't know was very simple but uh you know very funny basically the idea is that aliens abducted a a 1980s uh action hero type guy you know like we were saying kind of that duke nukem type of character who's uh you know has the rippling muscles and he's he's probably has roid rage and uh (laughs) you know he he looks like he's ready to go commando on everybody um so for for some uh strange reason which they learned to regret uh the aliens actually abduct abduct this guy and uh unfortunately for them he wakes up on the operating table on the spaceship and uh is none too uh, pleased to see that they are about to probe him, so he proceeds to go John Wick on uh, all the aliens on the ship, and uh, <laughs> you know it, it turns into a, a crazy kind of uh, action movie, you know, um, kind of Mars Attacks meets Commando, where you just have this uh, big muscly human beating the ever loving crap out of all these little gray aliens, mm-hmm. um, and of course we we have a bunch of twists and turns and, and things uh, go in a direction people don't expect which is what leads us directly into book two, uh, where, like I said, we kind of flip that, that dynamic where um, he, uh, the main character, the big muscly dude, who we just called the abductee, um, he actually ends up working for the Greys uh, to fight an even greater threat. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he, he is kind of a fish out of water in, um, in book two because he, he is uh, – yeah, like like you see in those preview pages, he uh, he's on the uh, Gray's home world, and you know he is kind of uh, you know the odd man out, but uh, you know he's still he's still that badass we know and love from book one. And uh, if even though he's working with the Gray's to for the greater good, um, if they if they rub him the wrong way, he's not afraid to uh, fall back on his old habits and and kick their asses. Um. And when when it comes to the when it come when it comes to that to that particular to that particular approach, um, I think the I think the uh, the other thing that I note that I noticed is an it is an interesting thing where there's there seems to be almost this um this horizontal design with the pa- with the uh, panels, um. Was that was that some was that something that you just naturally fell into when it came to the styling of it? Um, not on my part. Um, that that would definitely be a Canalis um take. Mm-hmm. Um, you buy Canalis, our artist. When I write my scripts, I don't usually uh, get too specific as far as like panel size. Uh, you know, I, I I write in a full script. You know, I, so I'll write you know page one and then. Uh, you know, however many panels I think should be on the page, and then I describe each panel. Um, but as far as uh, you know, I might say like, "Oh, this panel should be a close up," or "This one should be a wide shot." But otherwise, you know, I give uh, Canalis pretty much free reign to uh, interpret the script however he wants. So, yeah, he, that's uh, any kind of like framing and stuff. That's definitely Canalis uh, doing his thing. Speaking of that, how did you and how did you end up meeting up with um, Canalis and? and talking him into doing this yeah uh so this was way way back in 20 um 2018 believe it or not um the uh 
you know, the original deductibles campaign launched in 2019, but I had reached out to him a year earlier. Uh, I, I was familiar with his work with um, Richard C. Meyer. Um, they, they did a book together called Iron Sights, but even before that, they had um, done some smaller uh, comics for his Patreon, I believe. Um, so, you know, I was familiar with his work and, uh, I, I just liked his personality following him on Twitter and stuff. Um, I, I, but you know, so I just, uh, I was looking to uh, collaborate with artists and, you know, I, I liked, I liked the guy and I liked his work. So I, I just thought, you know what, let me just take a chance. So I, uh, DM'd him on Twitter and, uh, you know, I, I had the first eight pages of the abductables, uh, written. So I kind of pitched it to him as like, um, you know, hey, would this be something you're interested in working on? And uh, much to my pleasant surprise, he like got back to me like right away. And like, honestly, we didn't even like I had sent him the script and he just like sent me like the first page, like already drawn. Like, hey, what do you think of this? <laughs> I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, so that was really I really got lucky. Um, and I think it had a lot to do with me and him just hitting it off really well, too, because, uh, you know, we, we have a a similar sense of humor. And, uh, I think he really, I think the abductables really appealed to his, uh, aesthetic because, you know, he does have that kind of darkly comedic style, uh, where he, you know, he, he can sell the humor and he also likes to draw violent stuff, which, uh, I like to write violent stuff. So uh, <laughs> that worked out. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, I just think it was the right place, uh, right time and the right people. And, uh, you know, I'm so grateful that he, uh, he agreed to uh, bring my story to life. Mm -hmm. And w given given the set given the setup that you get that you guys have, have, have is it a case where you where you uh, send the where you send the script to him and then and then have it then give him free reign on that? And if and if so, have have there been any cases where he's sent back parts asking for more clarification on something? Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I, I, like I said, I write in full script. So, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll write it and then send it over to him. Uh, he, he tends to, uh, just, uh, interpret it himself. Uh, you know, he, like I said, we are kind of on the same wavelength. So when he, when he does draw my scripts, it's usually like, man, that's like right out of my brain onto the page, which is crazy. Um, sometimes he'll, he'll take, uh, take things in his own uh, direction you know slightly um you know maybe like for instance uh, there, there's a page on um the uh, campaign actually where uh, <laughs> uh not to get too vulgar but uh the abductee ends up uh, one some one of the grays uh, runs afoul of the abductee and he decides to punish him by uh, ripping off the arm of one gray and uh <laughs> probing the other gray with the severed arm <laughs> um and uh you know, I had written that page and, uh, I think there had been like an extra panel or two, um, in the way I had written it in the script. Um, but Canalis kind of simplified it to sell the joke even better. Um, so stuff like that, you know, uh, he'll change, but, uh, you know, usually, yeah, we, we usually don't, uh, kind of, you know, go back and forth too much. He just kind of, uh, you know, cause I trust his judgment, uh, to, uh, interpret the script. So yeah, he'll, he'll just kind of, uh, take it and run with it. Now, given now, um, given given that given that, now you get you guys are for this one you're you're shooting for about sixty pages and I'm I'm a, and you're going um full color, um, mm -hmm. when when it came when it came to the when it came to the color setup some, something that I did notice is a lo is a lot of emphasis on um on a bit, a bit of a mostly warm palette is what is what mm -hmm. I saw. Was that was that his, was that his idea to go with that kind of color palette, especially with a lot of purple and green? Because, well, we're 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 a few decades away from when that color scheme was was done to death. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, the purple and green was my idea, um, particularly for the abductee's uh, outfit, kind of his spacesuit. Um, it just seemed natural to me that, uh, you know, uh, purple and green, I mean, they're complementary colors, but at the, also, um, 
you know, when you're thinking, okay, well, what would an alien, uh, what would their like stuff, like their, their outfits, their spacesuits, like what would they look like? And, uh, purple and green just seem natural. Like that just screams alien to me. Um, and, and, you know, people have pointed out like purple and green, that's also kind of the uh, color scheme of like classic, uh, four color villains from like classic comic books, which I, I was like, Oh, okay. That's interesting. Uh, that's a good point. Um, I guess from a certain perspective, the abductee is the villain, at least as far as the aliens are concerned. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, yeah, like I said, it just, it just made sense. And then everything else, uh, that's totally up to Canalis. You know, he is, uh, uh, the first abductables was black and white. And like you said, uh, the second one, 60 pages, full color, uh, Canalis is doing the art and the colors. Um, and I just told him, Hey man, you know, the thing about book two is, you know, since we're visiting all these different alien planets and, visit, you know, seeing all these different alien races, you're pretty much free to interpret it however you want, because, you know, who's to say what these alien worlds should look like, you know? So he, he's definitely, uh, he's definitely free to uh, color it however he sees fit. And uh, it does give it kind of an expressionistic uh, feel, which I think is very unique. And uh, I think, uh, you know, something people aren't used to seeing. Mm -hmm. And, what and um, given uh, given all that, what would, what would you say were some of the big takeaways that you learned from the crowdfund of the first um issue that you're that you're taking into account with this second one? Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, it's funny. I'm on my third crowdfunding campaign. Um, you know, the first two funded successfully and uh, fulfilled successfully and got really good reviews. Um. But even though I'm on my third campaign, I still feel like I don't know anything. <laughs> you know, I, or, or at the very least, I still feel like I'm learning. Um, the thing about crowdfunding is it's so unpredictable that anything, any kind of lessons that I learned the first time and the second time around, it all, it all kind of gets thrown out the window uh, with each campaign because it's like, I almost feel like, you know, I'm starting from scratch each time. Uh, you know, it's, it's so unpredictable and you never know, like, it's hard to say, like, you know, when a campaign's a success or when it's a failure or when it's, you know, somewhere in the middle, it, there's so many factors going into it that it's hard to say, okay, this is why this succeeded. And because honestly, you know, not even talking about my work, you know, there's so many great uh, concepts and campaigns that either don't get funded or don't get the amount of funding that they deserve. And then, you know, not, not to name names, but then there's other campaigns that might not, at least from my opinion, be that uh, good looking, but then uh, make a ton of money. So, you know, crowd, crowdfunding is very fickle. And, um, you know, the only thing I can say for my, for me is that at the very least, you know, regardless of how things are received, um, I at least know what I'm doing as far as uh, creating the comic and getting the comic out. Um, you know, I know, uh, you know, the people have had some bad experiences with crowdfunding, but with me, they could at the very least, uh, trust that, you know, I know how to get these books out on time. I know how to ship them. Um, I know how to get them created and, uh, you know, Canalis is a very fast artist, so we're going to get the book out as fast as uh, humanly possible. And, uh, other than that, you know, you just kind of have to, uh, hope for the best and, uh, put out the best product you can which is definitely what we're doing and um make and make sure you don't jinx <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> yes because <laughs> some because sometimes 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 it's all about it's all well lady luck can be very very fickle as uh, absolutely as as i've often as i've often said jesus saves r and jesus doesn't <laughs> yeah and uh you know i I, I, like I said, I did get uh, very lucky uh, the first time around, uh, not only by a, by being able to work with Canalis, you know, the fact that we did hit it off and it was kind of lightning in a bottle creatively, but I also think uh, I was in the right place at the right time, uh, you know, as far as like, because when, when I launched the first abductables, uh, crowdfunding was, there was a lot of enthusiasm behind crowdfunding. And in a way, there's even more enthusiasm behind it now in the sense that there's like 
three times as many campaigns on Indiegogo than there was when I first started. Mm -hmm. And, you know, crowdfunding there's, there's al is like almost saturated with so many projects and there's a lot of great projects, but um, it's just, it's so much more crowded, uh, no pun intended now than it was back then, which is, I think good and bad in different ways. You know, it's probably as good that, you know, there's more eyes on the, uh, the platform and the, yeah, the whole idea of crowdfunding comics, that's great. At the same time, it makes more for more competition and uh, it's kind of harder to stand out from the pack. So, yeah. you know, it, it's good and bad in different ways. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's almost like a whole different uh, landscape than when I first started. And personally, I, um, something that I do find, I do find very interesting when I look at the whole crowdfunding scene is, the amount of straight up superhero comics that are on mm -hmm. crowdfunding, whether it be Kickstarter or Indiegogo or elsewhere, are not the majority that somebody might think. Um, no. Like a, now, gr now, granted, superhero comics don't have a don't have as much as strong of a foothold as one might think once you go outside of the United States. Um, mm -hmm. Especially, they especially don't have as much of a don't have nearly that kind of foothold in say um europe where there's a, a bit more where um, adventure comics ended up ta ended up being the dominant force mm -hmm. but you're see but you're can but through crowdfunds you're kind of seeing a lot you see a lot i see a lot more um comics of of genres outside of superheroes oh and while superhero is all is a very broad genre in and of itself um Obviously, when I'm referring to that, I'm referring to the typical, um, for lack of a better word, cape shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you're seeing, but you're seeing a lot of different, st a lot of different styles emerge, and even when people do dip into superheroes, um, it's not in the standard um, fashion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a uh, an interesting point. You know, obviously that's been a, a sticking point for a lot of people for so many years in the mainstream direct market industry was, you know, superheroes taking up 80, 90 percent of the uh, genres that uh, take up comic book shelves, which makes sense in the sense that, you know, Marvel and DC are the uh, big, big uh, companies as far as uh, mainstream comics are concerned. But, uh, you know, it's, it's ironic because people have complained that there's too many superheroes in comic shops. And then on crowdfunding, I've actually seen a lot of people say, hey, where are all the superheroes? Um, so, you know, it's uh, I've definitely heard people say that, uh, you know, that there's not enough superhero stuff, which is funny because uh, my second crowdfunding campaign, Grayscale, was a, a straight up superhero book. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was kind of attempting to... Uh, you know, fill that gap in a, in a way, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think we're seeing, uh, we're definitely seeing a lot more superhero stuff, but you know, that's, that's the great thing about comics is, uh, you know, it is just a storytelling medium. So, uh, any, you can tell, you can tell any kind of story you want within that framework and, uh, superhero is, uh, just one genre of many. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of superheroes. Uh, I plan to go back to my uh, superhero character at some point. Um, and, uh, but yeah, you know, I, I want to tell stories in all, all different genres and, uh, comics is a great medium for that. Yeah. Now, something, something else that I know when I sit, when I see the slides that you've got at the top of the, at the crowdfund page is a bunch of other, a, um, other alien types besides the, besides the greys. I mean, you've mm -hmm. got, the, you've got the avian, you've got the piss scene. I'm hoping I got that right. Um, the, the, uh, yeah, uh, Piscine is in, uh, yeah, is like a fish man. And with a lot of these, is it is it a is it a case of did you end up did you end up just brainstorming a bunch of different um, alien designs and then and then sent it to and then um, sent it to Canales? Um, so th th those in particular were uh, specifically designed. Uh, well, I mean, described by me and then interpreted by Canales. Um, you know, our main, our main villain, uh, for abductables two is called the reptilian, mm -hmm. which, uh, anybody familiar with, uh, kind of gray UFO, uh, lore is, uh, you know, we all know about the reptilians. Um, but I, I'm kind of taking it in a different direction. 
with uh, instead of the reptilians, it's just the reptilian who's this uh, savage kind of prehistoric, almost like a, you know, this scaly, you know, he, he's even bigger and badder than our main character was. Uh, and, uh, you know, going off that, I just thought it would be funny to, um, you know, add different types of uh, animal influence characters. So not only do you have the reptilian, but then you've got the avian who's a bird man and the Piscine who's a fish man. And then we even have a character called uh, the insectin who's a insect man. So, uh, <laughs> you know, but th- those are, those are specific characters, but um, there's a whole, whole slew of like foot soldier uh, alien characters in the book. Um, we actually call them the Divaloids. Um, and they are basically um, alien races that have been artificially devolved into kind of monstrous uh, life forms. Mm-hmm. Um, these kind of savage, almost prehistoric creatures that uh, uh, kind of make up the uh, the army uh, that's led by the reptilians. So, you know, it, Canalis is going to have his work cut out for him uh, designing all these uh, various characters. And the thing I told him in the script is that for the Devaloids, you know, you got to keep in mind since these are devolved aliens from all over the galaxy, from all, you know, alien races, all from any planet, all, all around the galaxy, they can look like whatever you want. You know, you're going to have your, your fishmen and your birdmen and stuff like that. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, you could, you could take any kind of influence you want and just go crazy with it. So expect a lot of crazy creature designs from Canalis and, uh, you know, the, the, these uh, devaloids are going to come in all shapes and sizes. I have to wonder. I have to wonder if the island of Doctor Moreau was an influence. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because uh, for sure, um, you know, they, there is a kind of chimeric quality to uh, these devaloids. And the thing is, the uh, devolution serum that created them—it's uh, the master. Uh, the masterwork of uh, one of our other villainous characters called the decrepit one, who's basically a, a gray alien mad scientist archetype um, kind of uh, he was exiled by the gray aliens uh, for being too crazy, you know, <laughs> which should tell you something because the grays are known for uh, their kind of weird experiments with probing people and stuff, you know, abducting people. So if he was too crazy for them, uh, that should tell you something. Um, so yeah, he's kind of the mastermind behind the scenes, uh, the, the puppet master pulling the strings and, uh, manipulating events. Um, but yeah, he's, uh, definitely a, a kind of Dr. Moreau, uh, in alien form. And well, at the very, at the very least, it could, it could be worse. You could be referencing the Dr. Moreau in the, in the movie version, which nobody wants that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, luckily I haven't seen that one. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the movie is, that, is... is that the one with uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Marlon Brando, or is there? Yeah, the, that the... yeah, that's it. That was him. And uh, oh. <laughs> the movie is the movie is not good, but the behind the scenes story. It's one of those cases where the behind the scenes story is far more interesting and far more fascinating mm-hmm. than the movie because you had. The t- the two leads were Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer, both of whom who are oh, known God. to be complete and total divas and assholes at the best of times. If not completely just insane people. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, both- that, I didn't know Val Kilmer was in it. I always knew uh, Marlon Brando was, which, uh, like you said, a notorious diva. And uh, there's some weird stories with him, like uh, the way he would act on set. Um, yeah, I can only imagine the chaos uh, <laughs> behind the scenes on that one. Although, although the idea, Mar- although Marlon Brando acting like a complete diva in a movie set in a movie set in a far off jungle, why does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, that's not the first time he did that. <laughs> Apocalypse Now being uh, the example. It wasn't. Uh, wasn't. Uh, Dr. Uh, Moreau, like that was like his final movie too, right? Yeah, that was one of his or... last movies. He was he was he was he was already on he was already on the decline. Is like, oh fuck, I need a I need a paycheck somehow. Um, mm-hmm. And there there's what I what I do find absolutely hilarious is how, is 
how li how little of a fuck he gave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, I'm just. I just know his uh, stories on Apocalypse Now, where he would like. You know, who knows how many of these are true, but you would hear stories of him like uh, writing his lines of dialogue on the other actor's forehead. <laughs> No, I don't know if that I don't know if that's the case. He didn't even study his lines, so they just had to put up signs and just and just and just put him in front of the camera and hope for the best and yeah. film him in the dark to hide the fact that he was grossly overweight. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, this makes me want to watch the movie now. I mean, it's probably I guess it could it be good in a like a or like in a room type of way where it's just a disaster and you just enjoy the, the I shit show. I guess. Um, <laughs> Not it, even that, huh? <laughs> it's bad in that it's bad in that sci in that sci-fi Saturday movie kind of way. Mm. You know those re those really bad those really bad straight to DVD movies that would always show up on the Sci-Fi channel. At least yeah. when the, at least when it was called that before it was called Siffy or whatever. <laughs> um Yeah, it's uh well, I mean, I guess it's kind of kind of suits the material. I mean, you know, playing that mad scientist character, you know, yeah. you got to embrace the madness. Yeah, and I, I, I can definitely I can definitely uh, see that. Now, the other um the other character in the in the sketches that I saw that I was curious about is the little green man. Are they basically the commandos of the Greys? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, they're they're kind of the uh, elite strike force of the Grey aliens. Um, you know they they're clad in that green uh, battle armor. They've got the most uh, highly advanced weaponry, and uh, yeah, they you know the gray aliens. They're not exactly known for kicking ass. Uh, they're known for probing ass, but not kicking it. Uh, they, they you know <laughs> that they're they're these. Uh, they got the bobbleheads and the small bodies. Or they're short, and uh, you know as we learned in the first abductables, not that great in a fight. Um, but they're not without their own method of defense and, uh, the little green men definitely constitute that, um, you know, they're, they're the best, uh, the best the greys have to offer in terms of, uh, fighting capability. Um, and again, that's just another case of me kind of taking, uh, you know, the, the alien lore, uh, and kind of, uh, the, the stuff that's associated with the gray aliens. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, kind of putting my own spin on it within the context of our story. Um, so yeah, I mean, every, you know, the the little green men, they kind of, you know, their their helmets have the antennas, and they, they kind of look like the uh, stereotypical Martians. So we, we're kind of combining those uh, that with the gray aliens in a, in a cool way. And something that something that I'm curious about in regard in regard to that is some. A lot of times we'll a lot of times we'll see we'll see the um this this particular group that's that's talked up about being about being the elite badass only only to get completely sh to get their shit completely kicked in by the by the actual villains. Um, is that a trope that you've been considering playing ar playing around with? Of yeah, these are the most elite of the elites, and they still get their ass kicked. Um, yeah, uh, yes and no. Um, you know, surprisingly, uh, th th let me put it this way. They'll actually do better than people think. Um, they're not the, the Imperial, they're not the stormtrooper principal. I'm, I'm guessing <laughs> some of them are, but, uh, you know, they actually, you know, so the abductables to the whole, the whole story culminates in this massive land war on this primordial planet, mm -hmm. um, between the forces of, uh, the reptilian and his devaloid army and the greys with their little green men and with our main character, the abductee kind of caught in the middle. Um, so, you know, the, the greys, you know, with the little green men, they, they actually put up a better fight than you would expect. Um, and they, they actually are featured pretty prominently. Um, but, uh, yeah, they're, they're definitely gonna, they're gonna have their work cut out for them because, uh, you know, even though they are the the elite strike force of the Greys, honestly, before the Reptilian came along, the Greys haven't really had much use for them. Um, they, you know, they're, they've for millions of years they've just kind of been doing their thing, uh, visiting alien planets, uh, putting down their crop circles, abducting the the resident life forms, and sticking things up their butts. 
Um, you know, n- really no need for a, a elite strike force. But uh, once the war breaks out, they're they're going to have to dust off the uh, the ray guns and uh, get to work. And we'll we'll see how how well they do. Yeah, and uh, obvious obviously the obviously in this sort of case, it's important to it's important to um, obey the age old rule. Anything worth shooting is worth shooting twice. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it you know they uh, they they the the character that we have uh, one of the characters that we mentioned the Piscean he's kind of this um, kind of mutated fish monster it looks he like look, he just crawled out of the primordial ooze he looks like um, he just came out of street sharks <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know he he yeah and he he looks like he uh, has trouble breathing uh, the the air. Uh, he looks like he should go back to the ocean, but uh, you know he he's kind of like the the primary antagonist for the little green men in a way. Um, for for a good portion of that land war, we actually focused on a, a, a battalion of the little green men, and they're actually getting slaughtered by the Piscine. And uh, it'll be up to them to uh, to defeat them one way or the other because uh, our hero is uh, busy uh, doing other things, uh, you know, fighting the reptilian and whatnot. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll definitely get a uh, really good look at uh, how well the um, little green men do in battle. And what the other th- the other thing that I'm the other thing that I'm curious about is when when you were writing out the um, sc- the script, when it comes to things like a massive land land war, were there were there notes that you put in to try and make sure that things don't get too busy? So so that. So, um, so people know where to focus their eyes. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, that's something I definitely take very seriously. Um, you know, I said that uh, you know it's all op- it's all everything that I write is open to uh, interpretation by Canalis. But that being said, um, because I write in a full script, um, I do uh, really put a lot of thought into uh, you know page and panel count and uh, how things are laid out and. Um, you know, I like to visualize it in my head and, and kind of utilize the comic book uh, sequential art form to its advantage uh, at the utmost. And, uh, you know, to your point, in a case where you have this massive battle going on with all these different characters, it, it is very important to uh, know where to focus things and not not get lost in the shuffle and really... Uh, you know, you, you, you got to know when to have those big panels and those uh, splash pages and spreads and stuff. And you got, also got to know when to uh, kind of uh, focus focus in on certain characters and stuff. So, yeah, I definitely put a lot of thought into that. And, um, you know, I, I'm definitely happy with uh, the choreography and kind of how uh, how that all plays out. So, uh, yeah, I don't I don't think uh, that'll be an issue as far as, uh, you know, people potentially getting lost in the shelf or anything like yeah. that. Now, I, I know that you're I know that you're shooting I know that you're shooting shooting for 60 pages like we said before but are are is it going is it going to be one continuous stream or are you planning on are you planning on separating the book into into segments and if so are you going to be, is one of those pages going to be dedicated to a table of contents uh no it is going to be uh kind of a one one shot thing uh, i don't i don't break it up into chapters or anything like that um you know 60 pages i found is a really good uh it's a really good page count for you know it's almost like the from my view like the equivalent of like a, a 90 minute movie um because you know within 60 pages you can you can have a nice three act structure um you know obviously you, you know, classic uh, monthly comics that you would get at the shop that they're about around 20 pages. So if you, if you look at it that way, we're, it's basically three issues in one mm-hmm. uh, with the abductables too. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, we, we don't, at least uh, for our book, we don't uh, break it up into chapters or anything like that. It, it, it really does read like a, uh, like I said, like a 90 minute movie with a, you know, a satisfying beginning, middle and end. And uh, it will have a very uh, definitive conclusion. Um, some, there, I do know that there are some comic creators who will put little, 
behind the scenes things in the le in the last few pages is that something that you're considering doing or are you trying to put as much story into those 60 pages as you can cram well reasonably so we don't want walls of text obviously yeah <laughs> um yeah so the 60 pages that's all story um we are going to have a pinup gallery in the back of the book um with uh, various artists uh, kind of interpreting the characters mm -hmm. um but yeah, we the, yeah the all those uh, initial sixty pages are to, uh, totally dedicated to the story, and um, as far as behind the scenes stuff, because you know I know a lot of people do like to see how these books are made, and uh, you know like to uh, kind of get the uh, the process behind uh, the making of these comics. Um, I actually do have a uh, me and Canales made a digital sketchbook uh, for the abductables that kind of goes into exactly that. Uh, we provide, uh, you know, I have the full script and then uh, Canalis has some exclusive drawings and we actually go, you know, we add our commentary to uh, the making of the book and we kind of describe how everything came together. Um, so if people do want to get that digital sketchbook, it, it does come included with the, um, the digital deluxe tier. And uh, we also have an add on for people who back uh, physically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, anybody who's uh, interested in stuff like that, definitely pick up that uh, digital uh, add on. All right, I I got you. And um, now you now you, now um, your sh your um, your shoot you're currently at seventy four percent of of the goal with um fifteen days left. Um, now before before I ask the next question, let me knock on wood for a moment. <laughs> um, now presuming e presuming everything goes as planned, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Are you thinking um? Are you thinking fall 2021? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I put the um, I put the fulfillment date a year out uh, just to hedge our bets because, unfortunately, unlike the uh, first abductables, uh, this time around, because Canalis is so busy, and uh, you know anybody who's familiar with his work knows he he works on multiple projects at once, so he's he's a very busy man and very high in demand artist. Um, you know, unfortunately, we couldn't have the, the entire book finished before uh, we launched the campaign. Um, so it is going to take a bit longer to get out mm -hmm. um, this time around. Um, but like I said, Canalis is a very fast artist. And, uh, you know, for what it's worth, the script's already written and everything like that. And, um, you know, it is just a two-man operation. Um, I, you know, he's, he's drawing and coloring everything. And I'm, I'm, I wrote the script and I'm lettering the book. Um, and, of course, you know, I, I'm very... I'm pretty much a grizzled veteran at this point as far as uh, getting books printed and shipped out is concerned. So that, that won't be an issue. Um, so yeah, I would, I would be shocked if it, you know, if not fall, uh, yeah, definitely fall of this year, if not even a little sooner, uh, you know, if things go really well. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, definitely, definitely, uh, around that time for sure. And give, and with all with all that with all that in mind, um, what? Ah, English. Would you believe English <laughs> is my first language? Um, I sp this might be this might be a bit of a silly of a silly bit of question, but it's one it's one that I've commonly asked writers because I'm guilty of this myself. Um, when writing the script, did you ha did you have your own little internal soundtrack playing? Because I know some people write to write to write to their own playlist, and just because it's just mm. because it helps them with their muse, and some people prefer dead silence. Yeah, um, you know, sometimes I write with music, but honestly, for the most part, I do tend to just write in silence. Mm -hmm. um, I find that music kind of can be distracting uh, in a way. Um, you know, it's funny you bring up a playlist because I actually did make one on my YouTube channel, just kind of like various songs that, if not, you know, not inspire the abductables, but, you know, kind of are evocative of kind of uh, the feel that we're going for, um, you know. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's one thing I am kind of jealous of artists is that, you know, when they work, they can actually either listen to music or like a podcast or something, but, when it comes to writing, it's really hard to do that, and yeah, it, so it usually is a, a lot easier just to write, uh, you know, without any kind of outside distractions. Mm -hmm. Well, 
I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how it how it develops. And with all that in mind, I do I do want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. And anytime, <laughs> yeah, man. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Yep. Anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for a future book or just a glorified shit post, or or <laughs> just or just ranting about bad movies, um, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> yeah, I'm always uh, I'm always down to talk about bad movies, and uh, you know it's it's fun to uh, talk about uh, old school comics with you as well. Uh, you know, I, I I rarely get a chance to do that, so yeah, it's a uh, it's always uh, fun. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun talking to you. Mm-hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to to come on to the sh- to come on and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay. Fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>